Amen. Please be seated. It is good to see all of you here this day. And before we come this morning to the passage which our dear brother John Babb asked to be preached at his baptism, let's once again pray together and ask the Lord's blessings on our time. Let's pray together. Our great and glorious God, we are so thankful that we could approach you this day. We are so grateful for the Christian Sabbath, the Lord's Day, whereby with the Apostle John of old we can be in the Spirit. We can worship you and know you and love you. We can draw near to you and trust that you will draw near to us. Oh Lord, as we come this day, we are looking to you for fresh help and grace from on high. We're asking, O oh God, that you would not leave us to ourselves, but that you would invade this place with your presence and power and person. O oh, gracious God, we ask that you would be merciful to us this day. Do us good and build us up in our most holy faith. O oh God, we pray that you would send the Holy Spirit to us afresh and give us help for all of our considerations. Lord, we ask that your word would run and have free course among us and that this word would honor and magnify who you are and all that you've done for us, your people. Come then and bless, save and sanctify. And for all of these things, we will praise and bless your most wonderful name. We ask them in and through that glorious name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I begin this morning by asking all of you here this day to imagine with me the following scenario. You're home and you're relaxing and then you receive a call from a nurse at the hospital telling you that someone that you love and is very close to you was just in a very serious car accident and that they only have a few minutes left to live. Now, the person who was in the accident was not a true Christian. Therefore, you know that you must rush to the hospital in order to speak to them concerning their never dying soul. You know that because according to the Bible in just a few minutes, this person will open their eyes in hell because they did not know Jesus Christ the Lord savingly in this life, you must go to them quickly. And so, there you are now, before this beloved friend who has rejected Jesus Christ all of their days. This person is perhaps even like some of you here this day who have not done what our dear brother John Babb has done, namely called out to Christ for life and salvation. And so what then do you tell this individual at this most crucial moment in time? What do you say to them as they are facing eternity? Well, thankfully, you and I have no reason at all to guess about this matter, and this is because it's addressed quite plainly in Acts chapter 16, and I ask you please to turn with me there in your Bibles. Acts chapter 16, where we have in verse 31 of this chapter what could be called a golden gospel verse, and from this verse we have the answer to our question at hand, an answer which I trust with the blessing of God will be a help to all of you in this place this day. And so as we come then to consider our passage for this morning under the general theme of a one-sentence sermon, I ask you please to notice with me first in verses 25 to 30 of this chapter, the confinement, the confinement. Here, as Luke narrates the account for us, he writes the following and says, look at the words with me there in your Bibles, Acts 16 at verse 25, I'll read to verse 30 in your hearing. Luke says, but at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. 
and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awakening from sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called out with a loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light, ran in, and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, the context, the uh, setting of this passage is probably familiar to most of you here this day. Here on this occasion, we have the Apostle Paul with his traveling companion Silas uh, preaching the glorious gospel of Christ there in the area of Philippi. And so there they were proclaiming the good news, the gospel, about how people can be reconciled to the God whom they've sinned against. And yet, as these men were doing this very thing, they were confronted by a demon-possessed slave girl who was a real distraction to them, as we're told in the earlier verses of this chapter. Well, so as to free this slave girl from this most deplorable spiritual condition and to stop the distraction, we're told in verse 18 of this chapter that by the authority of the risen Lord Jesus Christ, the Apostle Paul commanded the demonic spirit to come out of the girl, saying to the spirit in 18b of this chapter, note the words with me there in your Bibles, Luke tells us that Paul said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And then Luke says that he came out that very hour. Now, as a, a side note here, I ask, what do we see in this power encounter, if you will? Well, what do we see here? Again, as a side note, what we see quite plainly is that according to the word of God, there is absolutely no spiritual power whatsoever which could ever have victory over an individual when our Lord Jesus Christ ordains to deliver them. You see, brethren, I say that we see here that the risen Lord Jesus Christ is stronger than the strong man Satan. And why is this? Well, the answer is because according to Ephesians chapter 1, our Lord Jesus Christ is above all principalities, above all powers and might and dominion, and that he has the name which is above every name, and this not only in this age, no, but also in the age to come, praise be to his name. And so, having freed the slave girl, unfortunately, we're told that our old masters were not happy about this. And this is because when the demonic spirit left her, uh, she was bringing much profit to them by way of fortune telling, as we're told in verse 16 of this chapter. And so this no longer could happen. And so because this was the case, we're told next in verse 19 and following that these spiritual pimps seized Paul and Silas and that they dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities, and that after they had beaten them, they were then thrown in prison, and a certain Philippian jailer was commanded to keep them secure, as we're told in verse 23 of this chapter. And so here they were, Paul and Silas. They're put into the inner prison, and their feet were fastened in the stocks, as we're told in verse 24. And so, while no doubt, at this point in their lives, things seem quite gloomy, I ask, what are we told next 
in verse 25 of this chapter. Well, again, Luke writes saying in the following words, look at it with me there in your Bibles, Acts 16 and verse 25, he says, but, note the contrast, but, these men are in the inner stocks, their feet are bound, but at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Now, I ask, isn't this a strange thing to be happening? I mean, here we have Paul and Silas. And they are bound, and they are bloody, and they are bruised, and they are beaten. And yet, Luke tells us here in our passage quite literally that they were continually praying and singing hymns to God Nonetheless, oh, but brethren, I say that this sounds like craziness to be sure. But brethren, I say in truth, this is not craziness, no. Rather, this is biblical Christianity. You see, this is true Bible religion which teaches us that though at times we will find ourselves in difficult circumstances, nonetheless, because our great God has promised to work all things together for our good, we can bless Him at all times, just as the psalmist says in Psalm 34, the psalm we read in our opening time together. Listen then to the godly, reformed pastor named Samuel Rutherford in this regard, in writing in the 1600s while in prison. For the sake of the gospel, Rutherford wrote saying that, quote, the Lord is with me and so I care not what man can do. He said, I want nothing, for no king is better provided for than I am, for indeed sweet, sweet and easy is the cross of my Lord. For my well-beloved Jesus is kinder and warmer than ordinary in these particular circumstances. And he comes and visits my soul so that my chains are covered with gold, as it were. Well, again, as Paul and Silas were in the inner prison, which was the darkest place in the jailhouse, praying and singing hymns to God. Luke says again in the second half of verse 25 of this chapter, that the prisoners were listening to them. The sense in the original language is that they were listening intently to them. Well, as all of this was going on, we're told next in verse 26 of this chapter that there was a great earthquake, no doubt a supernatural occurrence, so that the foundations of the prisons were shaken, and that then immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. Now, this is the case, and then in verse 27 of this chapter, we're told that when the jailer awoke and saw that the prison doors were wide open, uh, supposing that all the prisoners had fled, that then he drew his sword and was about to kill himself. Now, we might wonder why he did this. I mean, what was all of this about. Well, simply stated, it seems that the Philippian jailer did this because he knew that the governing authorities would have taken his life if any of the prisoners under his charge had escaped. You see, this is how things went down at this time in history for such individuals. So that we're told, for example, in Acts chapter 12, that when the apostle Peter was set free from prison, by the angel of the Lord that, quote, Herod commanded that the guards should be put to death. Well, even though the jailer, this Philippian jailer, believed that suicide was the best option for him, Paul did not. In fact, since the Apostle Paul knew that suicide was never, underscore it, never an option for anyone, regardless of the situation that they find themselves in, we're told next in verse 28 of this chapter, 
Look at the words with me there in your Bibles. Luke writes the following and says, But Paul, called, that is called to the Philippian jailer with a loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm. Don't take your life. Why? For we are all here. Well, as Luke continues the narrative, we're told next in verses 29 and 30 of this chapter that the jailer then called for a light, which is to say he called for a torch to be brought in so as to brighten the dark place. And that then he ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas and asked them to be brought out. And then he said to them, look at the words, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, a beloved congregation here this day, if ever there was a question that any Christian, but especially these missionary evangelists, wanted to hear from an individual, surely this was it, right? I mean, be clear with me, dear ones here this day. When I say that this question is the most important question for anyone to ask, and this is because it has eternal consequences connected to it. What must I do to be saved? The most important question anyone could ask. And so let's examine this question together for a few moments. And so notice with me two things that it reveals about the Philippian jailer. And the first thing is that he was polite. He was polite. He was polite. Now why do I say this? Well, I do so because he begins his question by calling Paul and Silas sirs. Actually, from the Greek text, he calls them lords. Or better understood, in modern language, he calls them gentlemen. Ah, but having said this, not only was this man polite, no, but he was also perceptive. And this is because he said to Paul and Silas, Sirs, gentlemen, what must I do to be saved? He's perceptive. What must I do to be saved? Now, when this Philippian jailer asked Paul and Silas about being saved, when he asked them this question, should his words here be taken in the religious sense as meaning saved or delivered from the judgment of God do him because of his sins against him, or should his words be taken as being saved or delivered in the practical sense from the retribution that would come upon him from the authorities, because again, he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. Well, while I am sure that the Philippian jailer did not fully understand all of the theological implications concerning what it meant to be saved, I do believe, however, that he was thinking here in the religious sense as the rest of the narrative plainly shows. You see, brethren, quite plainly at this point in his life, the Philippian jailer himself had had an earthquake experience in his own soul. So that by God's doing, he came to see himself in truth, namely, as a lost, hell-deserving sinner who desperately needed to be made right with God, just as our brother John Babb has done. Now we might ask, how was it that the Philippian jailer knew to ask Paul and Silas specifically this most vital question about him being saved from the wrath of God because of his rebellion against him? Well, the answer seems clear enough. And it's because along with Paul and Silas of preaching the gospel in that very city where the Philippian jailer was, which he surely could have heard, 
We're also told in verse 17b of this chapter, look at the words with me there in your Bibles, Luke says that the demon-possessed girl cried out saying that these men are servants of the Most High God who, quote, do what? Proclaim to us the way of salvation. And then in 18a of this chapter, Luke says that she was doing this for many days. Now whether the Philippian jailer had actually heard this slave girl say this or not, certainly the governing authorities who put Paul and Silas in prison under his charge would have given him a heads up about this matter. Now, this seems to be the case and so having asked his vital question as he fell down before Paul and Silas in a posture of humble repentance concerning what was necessary for him to do in order to be saved in the religious sense, how did Paul and Silas respond to him? Well, consider this with me secondly now in verse 31 of this chapter under the heading of the command, the command here. As Luke records, our one-sentence sermon, he says it with one mouth, Paul and Silas said to the Philippian jailer regarding his question, look at the words with me there in your Bibles, they said to him, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. What must I do to be saved? With one mouth, here's how. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Now there are three things in these words that I want to highlight to you for a few minutes together. And the first is the central duty demanded. The central duty demanded. And so what's the a central duty which was to be carried out immediately as the aorist active imperative verb highlights to us? Well. Look at the words. According to the passage, it's to believe. That's the central duty demanded. It is to believe. Ah, but having said this, we ask now, what does it mean to believe, biblically speaking? Well, let me answer this firstly negatively. And say that to believe in the biblical sense is not merely to give mental assent with reference to Jesus. Uh, so that we just merely acknowledge that he lived and died and rose again? No. And further, uh, to believe in the biblical sense is not merely to, quote, accept Jesus into our hearts, as many people tell us in our day we're supposed to do, no, but rather now, secondly, positively and biblically speaking, to believe means to trust in. It means to rely upon and to cling to. You see, biblically speaking, to believe means to put one's complete faith in someone or in something, and this with one's whole heart. And so, in view of this, in order to be saved from the penalty of his sins from God, who was the Philippian jailer to completely believe upon and trust in alone for Salvation. Well, notice this with me secondly under the heading of the exclusive object identified. Here, upon hearing the Philippian jailer crying out to them, saying, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What must I be, what must I do rather to be delivered from the wrath of God? Well, without hesitation or delay, Paul and Silas say to him, to believe on or completely trust in, look at the language. The Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ, the exclusive object identified. Now, it's interesting that they did not say to him to trust in himself and he'll be saved. That's what many are telling us in our day. Or they did not say to trust in his good works. Or just as all False religions tell us in our day, such as a Roman Catholicism, etc. Nor did they say to him to look to the church to be saved or 
to your baptism to be saved or to look to Mary to be saved. No, but rather they said to him to believe on, not God the Father, no, nor God the Holy Spirit, no, but rather believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Ah, but having said this, the question that we need to answer now is, who is the Lord Jesus Christ? Who is he? Well, as most of you will know, no doubt, I'm sure, the answer of the Bible is that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Son of God and God the Son. That's who he is according to Scripture. The answer is that he is the sinless Savior, who in love 2,000 years ago, went to the cross of Calvary and willingly allowed our sins to be put upon himself and this so that he could be punished in our place and atone for our sins so that we could be completely forgiven of our sins. Praise be to his name. And so, here it is, brethren. So that simply stated, if you and I are ever going to be delivered from the penalty of our sins, then we must put all of our hope and all of our confidence in who Jesus Christ is and what he has done for us. This is what it means to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is exactly what our brother John Babb has done. You see, like the Philippian jailer who was convicted of his sinnerhood before God, so also John. Yes, by God's doing, John has come to see that all of his good works cannot make him right with God. No, but that only the blood of Jesus can cleanse him from all of his sins. And that only the righteousness of Christ imputed to him can make him acceptable to God. And because this is so, John has put all of his confidence in Christ's person and work as his only ground of acceptance with the Almighty. Now, this is the case. And why is this? Well, it's because according to the Bible, the one road to heaven is through faith alone in the finished work of Christ alone. It's because, according to Scripture, the one road to glory is by turning from our sins and casting our whole selves upon the whole Christ for mercy and forgiveness. And so you see, when Paul and Silas in our passage commanded the Philippian jailer to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, They were saying to him to trust in the Jesus whom they proclaimed. And why was this? Well, the answer is because according to Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, nor is salvation in any other. And why? Well, Peter tells us, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And so, in view of this, let me just uh, pause for a moment and say to any of you here this day who are not true Christians, that is to say, you have not been saved from the penalty of your sins, do you, from God Almighty. And say to you, my dear non-Christian friend here this day, that this is how you get saved. This is how you receive forgiveness of sins and get delivered from God's wrath because of your waywardness against him. You see, my dear non-Christian friend here this day, you also must come to see yourself in truth before the God of the Bible. You must also come to see yourself, as John has and every true Christian has, as odious in God's sight. And this is because through your lies and your lust and your fornication and your anger and your pride and your blasphemy, etc., you have offended God's holiness and you have violated his commands. And so what then must you do to be saved, delivered, even this very day? Well, the answer is you must turn from your sins. And put all your trust in Jesus' accomplished work 
as Savior. Who in love, 2,000 years ago at the cross, shed his blood so that people like you could be forgiven. What must you do to be saved? Answer the Bible. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put all your confidence and all your hope in his accomplishment there at Calvary when he died as the just one for the unjust ones that he might bring us to God. You must believe on him alone for life and salvation. And so, having seen from our chief verse in view this day, the central duty demanded and the exclusive object identified. Come with me now thirdly to note the blessed result promised. And so what is this blessed result? Well, we're given the answer. When Paul and Silas say to the Philippian jailer that upon trusting in Christ alone for salvation, he would be saved, blessed result. He and his household. Now, of course, when our verse here speaks about the Philippian jailer's household being saved with him, this does not mean that his faith would save them, no. But rather it means, as we'll see at the end of verse 34 of this chapter, that when they also trusted in Christ for themselves, to wash them from their sins that they, with the Philippian jailer, would be saved as well. And so, having seen from our passage and view so far, the confinement and the command, come with me now thirdly to note, in verses 32 to 34 of this chapter, the conclusion to the narrative. Here as Luke wraps up this account, he says concerning Paul and Silas, first in verse 32 of this chapter, look at the words with me there in your Bibles, Luke writes saying that then they, quote, spoke the word of the Lord to him and, don't miss it, to all who were in his house. Now what do we see here? But that after Paul and Silas had preached the glorious gospel of Christ to the Philippian jailer, that then after this, they continued to give him and those who were in his household more gospel instruction because Luke says that they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were there. Now, this is the case, and then as a sign of a thankfulness to them for preaching the gospel uh, to them, we're told in 33a of this chapter that the Philippian jailer then, quote, took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. Well, after this, in 33b of this chapter, Luke says that immediately, look at the words, he and his family were baptized, or more literally, immersed in water. Just as we'll do with John Babb in a few minutes. And so what does this show us? Well, it shows us at least two things. And the first is that those who were in the jailer's household could not have been infants, as some wrongly say. And this is because infants would have been completely unable to understand the gospel instruction which was given to them by Paul and Silas, which they needed to hear, understand, and believe in order to be saved. And then the second thing is that those of the jailer's household who were baptized with him definitely underscored, they definitely believed in God for themselves. Consequently, this is why we're told in verse 34 of this chapter, look at the words with me there in your Bibles, Luke writes saying, now when he, that is the Philippian jailer, had brought them, that is Paul and Silas, into his house. He set food before them and he rejoiced. And why was this? Well, Luke tells us when he writes saying that he rejoiced, quote, had believed in God with all his household. 
And so there it is, quite plainly, I trust. And so here then is where we end our considerations of this topic for today concerning a one-sentence sermon and all that was connected to it. This is what this very wonderful, important section of Scripture highlights to us. And so having considered it, what can you and I, who are believers in this place, take for ourselves having already spoken to non-Christians? Well, there are three things that I want to say. Three things, I'll list them out and then I'll come back to them. And so number one, our passage teaches us that when it comes to being Christians, we very well could suffer for our faith, just as the case was with Paul and Silas. Secondly, our passage teaches us that when it comes to evangelizing the lost, we must keep things quite simple, just as Paul and Silas did. And then thirdly, our passage teaches us that when it comes to following Christ, that in obedience to his great commission as put forth in Matthew chapter 28, we are to be publicly baptized in water just as our brother John Babb is doing today. And so three things by way of application. Number one, what do we get from our passage? So what? We've considered it. What does it teach us? First thing, beloved brethren, it teaches us that when it comes to being Christians, we also very well could suffer for our faith just as Paul and Silas did. Now this is a note that needs to be sounded, I think, all the time, but especially in these days and for the days ahead. I mean, we do not know what is coming down uh, the pike, as it were, to us. We don't know. We don't know what the days ahead have before us. But we do know that we are living in an increasingly hostile situation, an increasingly hostile context and setting here in America where people are openly defying God, openly denying the gospel, openly claiming to be atheists and homosexuals and lesbians and everything else under the sun and in connection to the alphabet. Days which are dark, days which are bleak, days which are difficult, just as the Bible warns us, would be at the end of days, difficult days. And yet, amid all these things, bless God that God's purposes are going forward, his elect are being saved, the church is being built, and people are being added to her, even as we're going to witness today. But that does not negate the fact that like Paul and Silas, who were faithfully preaching the gospel, that we're going to have people who are going to seek to malign us, and hurt us. And God has protected the church in America over the years for, for decades. But brethren, the Bible says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. And again, as we see all the open hostility to God, to the word of God, to the church and the churches all around, we must be mindful that greater measures of persecution upon us may be our lot for the days ahead. Thus it ought not to surprise us when we hear of more and more people losing their jobs and being threatened with this thing or that thing because they're seeking to be faithful to the Word of God. And so may God help us in this regard. As we seek to be faithful in our homes, Jesus even says there categorically that in your homes you will have trouble with non-Christians. A son against father, daughter against mother, etc. In our homes this will happen. In our communities this will happen. And I believe increasingly over the years to come. This was happening in the first century. This has happened all throughout the centuries. And it's going to continue to happen. For as Paul tells us, evil men will wax worse and worse. Jesus says, I tell you now so that you know. And we ought to have a heads up about all of these things. And so what should it produce in us? Should it produce in us fear? Should we cower? Should we not go out and proclaim the gospel? Well, of course not. 
In one sense, it should propel us to go forward more readily. Because that's what persecution often does to the church. That's what it did to the early church. The church was being persecuted. And then it says, and the disciples went out everywhere preaching the gospel. As a result of the persecution, they went out. And so may that be so of us. That persecution won't cause us to be navel-gazing and saying, oh, things are so terrible, and all the rest. They very well might be so terrible. But nonetheless, our Lord Jesus Christ is not only risen, he is reigning, and all things are under his governance, and he commands us, according to Matthew chapter 28, to go and to preach the gospel to every creature. And Jesus was able to see all the way down the corridors of history that persecution's going to come. But nonetheless, I command you to go. But I say, dear ones, let's be mindful that these things might be before us. And therefore, may we be praying, God, give us strength for the evil day. Help us to stand strong. Help us to open our mouths boldly, despite what might come our way, O oh God. Help us to be faithful even unto death. As it was with the early church, it will continue to be with the church through all of her days. But secondly, our passage teaches us that when it comes to evangelizing the lost, we must keep things simple, plain, basic. Just as the case was with Paul and Silas. What must I do to be saved? Well, let me tell you about superlapsarianism first. Let me tell you about the ordo salutis. Let me tell you about the hypostatic union. Maybe this will help you. It wouldn't help him. It would hinder him. Now, the ordo salutis and the hypostatic union and all the rest, those are good things for Christians. For Christians. But for the non-Christian who's sensing himself, herself to be guilty before God. Like, like, I know there's a God because creation proves there's a God. I know I've sinned against God because he's given me a conscience. So what must I do to be saved from this God who is holy and must punish sin? What must I do? Answer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Believe on the sinless substitute who died in our room and our stead, who accomplished our redemption, who paid our penalty in full there at the cross. Because the Bible says all who believe upon him alone for life and salvation will be saved. In the most memorable, the most notable Verse in all the word of God, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It doesn't get any easier than that. It's just plain. It's simple. It's straightforward. And so, brethren, when it comes to speaking to the lost, let's try to keep things very plain and simple. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. I know sometimes some of you men are in the habit when people come here to the church to give them our London Baptist Confession of Faith, that most excellent summary of those things most surely believed among us. You give it to them. If they're Christians, give it to them. If they're non-Christians, don't give it to them. Give them something a little bit easier. Just a little, a wee bit easier. The thing has sentences that run almost four pages. Give them something a little bit easier. Just wait, just, just wait a few days. Let God save them and then say, here's something that I think will be a blessing to you. Give them, again, John Blanchard's wonderful ultimate questions or all those wonderful gospel tracts that we have. Just keep it simple. Keep it simple. 
And again, I'm not saying, of course, you sin if you give them the confession of faith. But I think you get my point. Keep things simple. Keep things basic. I remember when I was there about 30 years ago in New York City, and I asked my pastor, so what do I do to get saved? I, I come, had come to see that it wasn't through baptism or anything that I could ever do. So what must I do to be saved? What do I do? And they said, ask Jesus to save you. Huh, that was so simple, so basic. Really? Ask him to save me? Why? Oh, because he's the Savior. That's just simple. Ask the Savior to save you? That makes sense. It makes good sense. Call upon him, and guess what? I called upon him, and guess what? He saved me. Call upon him. That's Romans 10. Ask Jesus to save you. And I called out to him, save me. I know I can't save myself. I know I must be saved. I know I'm under God's wrath. I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm stinking in his nostrils. I know all my lies, all my lust, all my fornication, all those things are before this flawless being and that his justice demands that he punishes me. What must I do to be saved? Trust in his son who was punished in your place so that you could go free. That was simple. That was straightforward. And so let's try to keep things simple when it comes to evangelizing the lost. Let's really try to do this. Let's really try to do this. Let's really try to do this. Why repeat it three times? Well, it's because we're Reformed Christians. And it's hard for us to keep things simple. We like big terms. We like big books. We like Greek and Hebrew. We like quoting John Owen. We like difficult things. We like big things. We like theological tomes. We like those things. And that's great. And that's how it should be for us as Christians. But let's remember where we once were as non-Christians. And how we just needed just the simple message to repent and believe. That is the apostolic model. May God help us to model it thirdly and finally. Our passage teaches us that when it comes to following Christ, that in obedience to his great commission, Matthew chapter 28, if we've been saved by Christ, we are to be baptized publicly in water, just as our brother John Bapp is doing this day. This is the great commission, and it ought not to be the great omission in our lives. A Christian says, I want to obey Jesus. So what do you call me to do? Publicly identify yourself with me. In this pictorial ordinance, which represents death to your old life and a rising to newness in life, and to follow after me. Be baptized in water. Tell the whole world that you've now broken with it and you've joined to me. This is not an option for followers of Christ. This is a command. This is what disciples do. And they do it joyfully. Joyfully. And then as we know, the church baptizes the individuals and then the individuals become part of the local church. They were baptized and added to the church there in Jerusalem, Acts chapter 2. And so after we baptize our brother John, we'll receive him into the membership of the church. And that's what Christ does and that's what Christ is doing all over the world, growing the church in many places. But if you're here this day and you're a disciple of Christ, you say, I know Jesus, I follow him. Jesus says, if you love me, obey me. If you love me, keep my commands. And this is his initiatory command. Be baptized. Go public with your faith. So may God help 
any disciple here this day who has not done this. Obey Christ. Be baptized. Join the church. These are all ways that you display that Jesus is Lord of your life. That he owns you and that he's your master. That what he says goes. That's what the true Christian wants to do. Amen? It's not a hardship for him. It's not a hardship for her. Is that what Christ said to do? Uh, let me do it. If in fact I've got a credible profession of faith, let me do it. Let me go forward and own this Savior who has owned me by His grace. And so may God grant it to be so. And may God bless all of our considerations to all of our hearts. Let's pray together. Our gracious Lord, we are thankful for this one sentence sermon. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Work it into our hearts, Lord God. And produce in our own hearts praise to you for we have believed on Christ and have been saved. We're thankful for new life in him. We're thankful for the forgiveness of sins. We're thankful for the Holy Spirit. We're thankful for the church. We're thankful for our brethren. We're thankful for you, O oh great God. We bless your name. And we pray that as we now come to see John get baptized in water, that for all of us here who are true Christians, it will rekindle in our hearts fresh love to you. Stir up fresh commitments in our hearts. Kind of like when we go to a marriage and we hear vows taken, we say, oh yeah, I remember when. Help us to go back to those vows that we made to Christ when we were newly baptized. And we said to him, you're Lord over all. And whatever you say goes. Help us, Lord, to think on all of these things. Bless then this opportunity now. We pray and ask all of these things in that wonderful name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.